Hello. All right, well, um, let's start the second part of our session. Our first speaker is Nick Noki, who will be talking about um, the physics involved in trying to minimize the amount of pain as you drop water. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I'm Nick Kenoki, and I'm going to be talking about rock climbing hip movement on overhanging terrain. And I'll kind of use this next diagram to describe a little bit more what that means for those of you that don't spend your afternoons climbing rocks. Um, as you can see, this is not a rock. This is actually Colgate's very own Angered Family Climbing Wall. And this was the climbing route that I used in my study. Um, this is one of my participants, Anna, and she's at the back of the room. You can get her autograph after the show. Um, but this is an overhanging wall, which just means more than vertical. Um, and I'll kind of get into what I'm doing here. Um, so I was concerned with the hip movement analysis of rock climbing. So obviously there's physics involved with almost everything that we do. Um, and a lot of people think friction immediately when they think rock climbing and physics. But I was interested in kind of looking at the hips because as you can see, there's a lot of hip movement going on here. And I just kind of wanted to look more deeply into that and kind of try to impact that. So my initial hypothesis was that there would be some correlation between hip movement and experience. Like maybe more experienced climbers would have their hips more into the wall more often or more range of hip movements, something like that. Um, so just to kind of give you guys an idea of what's going on, um, I'm going to talk about how I did my experiment, what I found, my results, um, and then kind of give some explanation of why I think that might be the case and then kind of uh, suggest some things for future work. Um, so, uh, what I did, uh, I took data by taking videos of the climber, as you guys saw. Um, I was taking videos from the side view so that I could see the hip movement in and out of the wall. And I studied 11 different climbers uh, in a variety of experience from beginner to advanced on one route. Um, so, uh, one route meaning they took the same path up the climbing wall. And the way I characterized uh, experience was based on how long the people had been rock climbing for and how frequently they rock climbed during that time. So uh, this is just uh, an idea of what the interface was for me. After I took a side view video of a climber, I would put it into this tracker software and then I would go through frame by frame clicking the hips every time and I would get a plot something like this and time x y values and that isn't as pretty as what I ended up making it. Um, this, is some, this is that same data uh, shown in a different way. Here's the X displacement and the Y displacement of the hips going throughout the climb. Here's an approximate climbing surface. And as you can see, this climber's hips are kind of oscillating in and out of the wall as they move up through the climb. So um, what I found uh, through my study Oh, that's kind of a, an average hip displacement line. Um, so what I found through my study, uh, I kind of thought that there was going to be, you know, maybe more experienced climbers would have less, uh, less average hip displacement from the wall. So maybe their hips, their average would be much closer to the wall and maybe less experienced climbers would be more, you know, farther from the wall or something like that. I didn't find that. Um, and what I also didn't find was that there was any kind of significant correlation in the standard deviation. So basically that means from this average line for a climber's hips displacement, you know, how much are they varying? How much are they straying from that average distance? So I thought maybe more experienced climbers would always have their hips only, you know, one foot away from the wall or you know, and maybe more inexperienced climbers would constantly be, you know, three feet, one foot, you know, and something like that. But again, uh, my data didn't show that, and maybe I didn't take enough data points or, you know, something like that, but I'm going to treat it as whatever significance I can for now. Um, so I thought to myself, maybe it's not the hip distance from the climbing surface that matters. Maybe it's the hip to hand distance. And the, the reason why I started thinking about this was I kind of started thinking about, well, maybe you can just roughly approximate a climber as a pendulum. And maybe 
it's just more efficient to always have your hips, maybe your center of mass around something around your hips, right below your hands as opposed to out to the side. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll see if I can find some correlation there. And so when I plotted, again, uh, the X displacement, uh, this time I used time instead of the Y displacement, but here again is the climber's hips as they move up the rock wall, um, which would be something like that. And the red line is the hands. So there are five different holds the climbers used on this route. And basically you see their hips kind of moving in and out, often near the red line, but often not exactly on it. But of course that's just one climber. Um, the average plots. So again, I, I didn't see, you know, I thought I might see that as experience increased, I might see, um, a, a, again, less average displacement between the hips and the hands, and that's just horizontal displacement. Um, but again, outside of this, you know, this one climber who was inexperienced and had great displacement between hips and hands, that's kind of what I expected, but I expected something more like the more experienced climbers, their hips would be right under their hands. And I didn't see that. Um, and so kind of, where does that leave me? What do we know? Um, so we know that when people are climbing, you know, they're hanging off a rock wall, the forces acting on them are gravity, and the sum of all the other stuff, their, the tension in their arms, the leverage from their feet, all that has to oppose that force of gravity for them to stay on the wall. Um, so when I watch climbers, um, when I climb, I see a lot of this hip movement, and you guys saw it too in that initial video that I was showing. There's something going on here. The hips in technique is something climbing coaches and you know is often give as a technical tip to young climbers. Get your hips in. I always hear that. So why 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 do we say that? And here's just that motion again. Um, so why do climbers utilize this position? Um, Basically, it's, it's complicated, so disclaimer, my kind of analysis from here on out is just qualitative, like my postulation, uh, because I, I don't have the, the PhD in biomechanics and I can't actually do out all the complicated involvement of the joints and the forces and tensions. So uh, one thing I thought, all right, so why is it beneficial to get your hips into the wall versus your hips out? And maybe when you do this, you're able to use your feet more effectively to oppose the force of gravity. Here it kind of looks like uh, maybe all they could do at best is push you out from the wall. Here it looks like, all right, maybe I can get my, my weight a little more over my feet, something like that. So that's one reason I thought the hips in position might be useful. Uh, second, you know, when I look here, I see, all right, climber's got his hips out and his arm, the arm tension is kind of not directly opposing gravity. There's this angle theta here between the opposition of gravity and where he's actually pulling. So maybe that creates some sort of torque unnecessarily in that shoulder joint. Maybe that's not as good as when you have your hips in, your arms straight up opposing the force of gravity. But of course, yeah, there's, these are not connected. There's something going on here in the core. So it obviously isn't that simple. But again, I'm not in a place to uh, really experimentally figure that out. And again, it's not that simple. Um, so climbers use, from my, from my data, I see that climbers use the hips in position and the hips out position. Um, so why would you want to have your hips out ever? Um, and again, maybe, maybe it has something to do with this idea of a pendulum. Maybe, maybe it is just more efficient to be opposing gravity kind of directly like that as opposed to out to the side, but I don't really know. So kind of the significance of my project was basically that climbers utilize both these positions and it's not one or the other that seems to be beneficial in all circumstance. Um, and I think this is due to the complexity of rock climbing and the variety of movements that you find yourself in. But basically for future work, I would suggest, you know, of course, a complete biomechanical uh, analysis of all that stuff that I could not do in, at least in one semester. Um, someone with a PhD in that should do that. Um, but I think even without doing that biomechanical analysis, I think there's something significant in the data that I was taking. Because when I look at the shape of different plots, you know, here's an inexperienced climber's X and Y displacement graph, and here's an experienced climber. And you know, while these are just two climbers out of my 11 participants, 
these were kind of indicative of the inexperienced and the experienced, and there's something drastically different going on here. So whatever metrics I was looking at, it clearly didn't filter out, or maybe I didn't have, take enough data, or maybe uh, my uncertainty, which was only 0.05 feet, uh, was too large in some cases, or you know, something. Something wasn't working for me. My hypothesis were not proved. I wasn't seeing the correlations I expected in my data, but I, there's something here. So I think further study needs to be done to suss out you know, what the difference in that shape uh, is you know what's responsible for this difference in shape and maybe do a more dynamic analysis of rock climbing I was very concerned with looking at rock climbing in these two positions hips in versus hips out when really rock climbing is a movement it's a flow and it involves velocities and momentum in ways that my analysis did not consider so I think basically I found what I already knew in that rock climbing is a very complex um, movement upwards and outwards if you're climbing on overhanging rock. And I think more needs to be done uh, with my data specifically, but in the total sphere of rock climbing in general. And uh, that's my talk. Um, so you, you it seemed from this talk you were looking at hip position kind of on average over the whole climb. Yep. But I remember, you know, early in the semester you were looking at kind of moves where someone would, you know, move their hips in and then move their hand and then, you know, that was considered a move, I guess. One and, move, yeah. You know, did you, you know, try to look at, you know, the moves specifically? And, and, uh, yeah, it so... It seems like the, the moves, you know, so you call them, would be different than when someone was just kind of hanging and resting. Right, yeah, so here you can kind of see, you know, I showed that little short animation of uh, one of my participants getting his uh, hips in and up. And so, yeah, maybe this is one of those moves that you're talking about. And I do think, uh, I, I did not look um, like very in-depthly at one move. I chose to look at a few and kind of see if I could find some similarities over the course of the climb. But I agree, I think there, there's definitely a lot here. And when you slow this down and really look at um, all the individual pieces of the body that are going on and the shape of that movement. Um, so like, you know, when he's doing that, is he getting his hips in first and then up? Or is it kind of linear, you know, up into the wall? Uh, or, you know, is it just kind of a more little angular stepping. You know, I think that's definitely something that should be looked at. And my study did not focus so in-depthly on one single move, but that's a great thing that someone should look at. John. When you did your, uh, when you were averaging these, did you, uh, did you average about like a, a sloped line that approximated the surface of the wall, or were you just doing flat like X and Y averages. Yeah, so the way I got these averages was, let me see if I can find that. Oh, yes. So I would find a line based off of where the climber's hands were, because uh, the climbing holds that they were holding onto were attached to the wall. And then basically I would uh, get the distance from each point, the, the closest distance to that line. Um, and then that, that average would end up as a, a line parallel to the plane um, and just of varying distances from that. Yeah. When you were taking your measurements of the hips, did you get like, say like a right hip every time or were you taking like the middle? Yeah, so the source of my uncertainty was that when I was going through the, the tracker program, it can auto follow a mass <coughs> per se. But um, because of all the hip movement and turning, I couldn't just attach like a red dot to the outside of the person's hip because that sometimes go back and sometimes forward. So I had to go frame by frame and just look, all right, you know, where's the center of their hips regardless of, you know, where they're, they're turning and whatnot. So the way I got my uncertainty was to go through a climb <coughs> twice and then look at the difference between the two points at each point basically 
um, and that, that turned out to average came to 0.05 distance, but that's definitely a source of uncertainty. And if I had um, maybe like a 3D modeling suit or something, that could much more exactly find this out, but yeah, that was what I did. Okay. Can you show the video at the beginning? Yeah, and again, just. Yeah. stuff you guys right. should watch rock climbing well, videos. Uh, it, it, it seems that that when the hip is in that's when the climber actually pushes with uh, her legs. It does and, seem that way and, right? And maybe that, that's a clue. Right? Uh, yeah well yeah so it seems like you're kind of indicating what I was thinking like maybe getting your hips in allows you to use your but legs. But in the data it almost seems like that the hip is going zigzag and then you never see that in the data that the hip goes parallel to the, like if you show the data, mm. I never see the hip going parallel to the line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't, you're right. So, of course, this is just one climber. But yeah, so this climber, it seems like they're getting their uh, hips in, you know, up into the wall and then kind of hanging them back out and then back up into the wall and then back out. You're right, they're not just like moving on a steady track parallel to the wall, that's true. Um, sort of going off of that, uh, with your uh, measurements of the climbers, mm -hmm. I, uh, you have been focusing on the uh, sort of two-dimensional uh, aspect of it. I'm curious, how, uh, how much of a change in the hip placement in a third dimension, say going mm -hmm. in and out of the screen, uh, how much might that have uh, or how much would that impact the overall understanding of how it moves? Would it be negligible? Is it something worth looking into? Oh, yeah. So, so you're imagining almost, you know, I was showing like a side view of a climber, and you're imagining almost a back view looking at my hips moving sideways. In addition, say, right, like, right. Just because yeah, right. Like there's some movement in and out of the uh, frame of reference. Right. So, I mean, that's. That adds a whole another dimension, literally, to the pro. You know, like that's that's totally something that should be looked at. And unfortunately, I, you know, I thought about doing that and maybe trying to model in three D, but that that would have been quite complex. And in the course of a semester, I couldn't. Sure, sure. Quick, quick. Yeah, it's very quick. It's just like a. I don't know if you've looked at this, but I know for um, modeling animation, um, they put them in the black suits with little white right. dots on them. Right. Yes. I don't know if, like, if there's any that's very. Uh, information out there about how they kind of translate the of like a human doing things into like a CGI model of it, because that could be really helpful. There is, and there's some of the few papers that I found kind of trying to look at a more holistic picture of rock climbing movement utilize that technique of almost animation and, and using that full body suit. And we toyed around with creating one of those, but didn't have enough cotton balls to put on the boot side. <laughs> Next time. <laughs>